Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Uh, I'm excited to see some of you all here again today. So I was uh, here for a little bit yesterday. Today we've got a panel uh, we've put together um, uh, related to this thing called the Human Context and Ethics of Data, the program that Professor Catherine Carson and I uh, run here at Berkeley. Uh, but we brought in some folks, uh, uh, both from Berkeley and some, uh, from some other places, to talk to you a little bit more about um, sort of their expertise and experiences uh, around bringing the social sciences and humanities to bear on teaching in this field that at least we call human context and ethics of, of data. So the title of today's panel is Teaching Human Context and Ethics of Data, Engaging Interdisciplinary Expertise on Society and uh, Justice. Um, so I told you a little bit about like what the point of the panel is. Um, uh, we brought folks with some different disciplinary backgrounds. There's a kind of common thread that they all have some training in what's called STS, Science, Technology, and Society. And they all have a shared interest uh, in figuring out how to teach uh, uh, data science and technical students uh, issues around uh, uh, ethics and human contexts. Uh, and have thought really hard uh, about what it takes to bring some of the tools and methods of their respective disciplines to bear on doing this kind of work. The plan for today uh, is that uh, I'm gonna, well, next introduce everybody that we've got here. Um, then I'm gonna give each of the panelists kind of five to, you know, five plus minutes to say a little bit more uh, sort of about themselves, what they do, their backgrounds, um, uh, that they're kind of relevant to this panel. Uh, then after that, we'll switch to, uh, I'll ask a couple sort of questions uh, that I've, uh, from my experience and from talking with uh, some of the folks uh, at this conference and similar conferences have a sense of, they're kind of good questions to get things started. And then after kind of going through those, uh, we'll open up uh, questions to the audience so you can learn uh, more from, from that. So uh, let's get started. Uh, looks like one of our panelists is not yet here. So um, I guess I'll introduce him if he, if he manages to get here. Um, but uh, we'll skip that. I was going to go alphabetically ordered. So the next uh, panelist we have here um, is uh, Morgan Ames. Uh, Morgan Ames is an assistant professor of practice in a school of information and is associate director of research for the Center of Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society at the University of California, Berkeley. Her book, The Charisma Machine, The Life, Death, and Legacy of One Laptop Per Child, uh, published by the MIT Press in 2019, uh, was winner of the 2020 Best Information Science Book Award, the 2020 Sally Hacker Prize, and the 2021 Computer History Museum Prize, draws on archival research and ethnographic fieldwork in Paraguay to explore the cultural history, results, and legacy of the OLPC project, and what it tells us about the many other technology projects that draw on similar utopian ideals. Great text, by the way, I've taught with it, fantastic teaching tool, highly, highly recommend. Um, that she bridges science and technology studies, media and cultural studies, and human computer interaction in her classes, which include behind the data, humans and values, uh, social issues of information, and introduction to information studies. Thank you, Morgan, so much for joining us. Next, we have here uh, Catherine Carson, who is a historian of 20th century science and an STS, so again, that's science, technology, and society person, and chair of the history department here at Berkeley. She's been involved with data science um, uh, since it got started, starting with Berkeley's Social Sciences Data Lab, a laboratory, that's D-Lab. Uh, I think you're gonna hear some more from them uh, at this uh, workshop if you haven't already. The Berkeley Institute for Data Science uh, and then the Undergraduate Data Science Program. Uh, she and I work together on human context and ethics in the uh, Undergraduate Data Science Program, which is what I spoke to you about uh, yesterday, what we call HCE. She has a background in theoretical physics, um, a sideline in 20th century philosophy, and is published on engineering ethics coming out of a decade of work with nuclear engineers before and after Fukushima, um, before she came uh, to data science. And then lastly, uh, we have Mauricio Nacaro uh, as a PhD candidate uh, in the joint UC Berkeley, UCSF medical anthropology program uh, with a designated emphasis in science and technology studies. He also holds a PhD in theological and religious studies from the Graduate Theological Union just up the hill from here. 
His current dissertation entitled Recovery and the Addiction, Practices and Dimensions of Liberation uh, in Northern India, examines of sovereignty, recovery, and the afterlives of modernity in the Indian state of Punjab during the COVID-19 pandemic. He's interested in understanding how journalists, public health officials, psychiatrists, people who use drugs, and their families construct notions of freedom, bodies, drugs, and desires, and clinics, recovery groups, and news reporting, and how such notions shaped epidemiological uh, sensibilities, interventions, therapeutic practices, and relationships between science and religion. Mauricio was also the head GSI uh, for Data 104, Human Context and Ethics uh, of Data, the class that uh, uh, Catherine Carson and I teach uh, every semester, uh, and also gave a fantastic uh, lecture on uh, global data uh, as well. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over um, to our panelists. Uh, to say a little bit more about themselves and their backgrounds and who they are. Um, we're going to start, uh, I'm just going to go for this, this one, uh, go alphabetically, um, and we'll start uh, with uh, Morgan Ames. Morgan, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ari. I'm so happy to be here. Um, thanks to all online and those in person. Um, so my, my background blends a technical undergraduate and a social science graduate program. Um, and I tend to lean on this a lot in my own understanding. So my undergraduate was in computer science, actually at UC Berkeley. Um, I graduated there. I had done some human computer interaction research as an undergrad and knew that I needed more of a social science background to actually effectively do HCI research. Um, and so I did a PhD in communication at Stanford with a minor in anthropology and um, really love bringing both of these to bear. So I, you know, I've, uh, there's, there have of course been some changes in technical education in the last gosh, 20 years since I graduated undergraduate, but, um, but there's a lot that's the same too. And so I can really lean on what I experienced pedagogically in the classroom to break apart some of the mythologies, some of the misconceptions about not only social sciences, but about technical um, disciplines as well. So that's one thing I really enjoy doing. Um, as a reset, I tend to lean um, a fair amount on science and technology studies. I find this very effective um, as a tool because many STS scholars similarly blend um, kind of te the technical and the social. Um, STS is concerned with studying the processes of scientific, um, of knowledge creation, whether it's scientific, whether it's, um, you know, creation of artifacts, technological artifacts, creation of data sets in data science, um, analysis of data sets, all of those processes um, become it themselves the object of analysis. And as such can be very insightful for helping data scientists think a little bit more carefully about, about the politics of data science, about the power they wield as data scientists and about some of the limitations of data science. Um, one of the things that I tend to pick apart in uh, in my own classes, in fact, we start with it, we uh, read some feminist science studies and apply it to data science to kind of break apart this, this illusion, this myth, as I call it, of objectivity, right? That data is objective. You collect more data, it's more objective. Um, and so uh, we very early on um, integrate a frame around um, kind of a, objectivity, one metaphor I like to use um, is that of a map, right? So maps are useful. Um, there's a Borges uh, short story about a map that exactly corresponds to the world and that becomes not useful because the whole point of maps is that they are abstractions, right? And the choices we make about what to show on those maps um, change with what kinds of uses we put them to. They might be a map for driving, they might be a map for transit, they might be a map for waterways. Um, but all of those make choices about what to show and what to not, what to emphasize, what, what not to. Um, and uh, similarly, data science is, uh, is like that. I think I'll, I'll get more into some examples as we go along, but that's just a little bit of an intro into what I, some of my own outlook and, and what I work on. Great, thank you so much, Morgan. Um, sticking with our sort of alphabetical order, I'll turn things over uh, to Catherine Carson uh, next. All right. Um, so you heard a fair amount about Data 104 yesterday from RE, so I won't say a whole lot about it, but I'll say a little bit about what brought me to teaching that class. Yeah. 
Well, maybe we can wait until folks also. We can hear you. Okay, so I will. I think I'll stand up. Is that all right? Is this good? But I'd like to move out. Okay. Boom, you're on. Okay, well, it's a little. Okay, let me try this. No, it's going to be that. What would you? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to try this. I'm not sure what to do. Well, maybe I will just stand up so I can present more that yeah. way. I think with the yeah. door shut. Okay. Actually, we need to next. Yeah. Okay, no mind. Um, and I, I think I will take all the notes for everybody here on like that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so because you heard about Data 104 yesterday, I, I won't repeat that. But I will say something about what brought me to invest a huge amount of my effort and actually like the teaching component of the history department in building this class. Um, like Morgan, who explained that she was an undergrad in STEM and actually in computer science here at Berkeley. As Arvi mentioned, I was an undergrad in STEM. I actually stayed with theoretical physics through a master's degree, but all the way through felt to myself, what I really care about is human beings, how they interact, how things change over time. And because I grew up in theoretical physics in the 1980s and during the Cold War, I knew from the start that as a theoretical physicist, I was being trained to go into the weapons labs and had sort of struggled with myself. Like there's power and responsibility that comes with having STEM skills. And you shouldn't simply assume that because your intentions are to you know, gain theoretical knowledge for its own sake, that you won't end up in situations where you'll need to make some tough decisions about how you use your expertise. So I very much brought that perspective as someone who trained deeply in STEM and then decided to go in another direction into a class that was meant to meet our undergraduates where they are acknowledging that there's beauty and joy in STEM and also acknowledging that data science is growing because it really serves the interests of large corporations, especially here in California, and serves to shift power in really unsettling ways in some settings and in other cases, quite exciting and you know forward-looking. So data science came across my radar screen, as, as Ari said, after I had basically wound down a decade of collaboration with nuclear engineers, who during the time that I was with them had gone through the Fukushima disaster. And I had sort of understood what it's possible to do as a social scientist in that setting, because it was made very clear to me that only engineers get to teach engineering ethics. And that seemed to me a real limitation that actually there's strength in STS and in history as well, that is really valuable for helping students come to grapple with the kinds of questions that they'll face in their own lives as people with technical expertise moving into settings where they have a whole lot of power and need the kinds of analytical skills that, um, that the social sciences and humanities bring. So maybe I'll say, two just sort of follow up things about that. One is about why we named this program in Berkeley Data Science Human Context and Ethics. Because ethics itself is a very powerful resonant word, especially in engineering ethics where it's often required by accreditation. And we felt we wanted to move the frame, we wanted to broaden the frame around that to acknowledge that what's really at stake in doing STEM work with these abstract tools is figuring out how to be responsible and responsive to the people in their contexts with which our students would be working. So we made sure that we said that ethics is part of this, but we acknowledge, at least Ari and I feel very strongly that like classical Western white male moral philosophy is not adequate to meet the needs of students today. 
And so we have to figure out how to come up with a form of ethics that is fundamentally relational and contextual oh. in order to, hey, sorry, <laughs> um, in, in order to actually acknowledge that like we've you know gotten ourselves into this situation where the tools that are classically presented in philosophy aren't actually up to the job. So how can we work together across disciplines to come up with an ethics that is human and contextual? And as we've learned over the years here in data science oriented towards justice. So for us, like the human context and the ethics aren't separable. And for us also STS is a pretty good foundation for understanding what kinds of responsibilities we take on and our students take on as practitioners of technical fields in a fast changing social domain. So with that, I think, can I say one more thing about like why history? Um, because both Ari and I are trained as historians and sometimes I don't even say that in these settings because people are like, what's a historian doing here? History is about the past or else they think like history is there because you know, students should be well-rounded and they should know about the past. History is not about the past. History is about how human change happens over time. And we happen to take the examples from the past because that's where our data is. But it is so like interesting and complex and subtle to learn how to study human change over time by looking at history. It's the sort of thing where everyone thinks, oh, I can write a chronology and that will be the history. And as someone who's been in history now for 30 years of my life, I realized that history is as hard as theoretical physics and that just sort of dumping that on students and saying, you need to learn the history doesn't do the job. So Ari and I have been working about how to drill down and like simplify what historians learn about how to see like how the past is folded into the present so that students can become conscious of it and learn to see it even though it's almost invisible. Um, all of the, the, the things we take for granted because they've been handed down to us from, you know, from past social institutions or in the case of data science from the data, which always comes from the past, what is folded into the data itself. So we try in data 104 to teach students to see those legacies so that they can make other choices about it. And like one example we often use is, it, it's not an accident that statistics is called statistics. It originated as the science of the state. It came into being in the you know, 17th and 18th <laughs> centuries as states were consolidating their power to rule their citizens. So if we're going to have a statistics in the future, that's not just you know, the top down view ruling from above, that's actually inclusive and brings in knowledge from below, which may not always be quantifiable. If we're going to have a data science for the future, that isn't just you know, the past of statistics, which was about ruling people and controlling them. Then we need to acknowledge that that's the statistics that we've got, I'll say more about this later, and also acknowledge like we wanna make different moves now. And we can only see that we need to do things differently if we understand how we got the statistics we have. That's a bit of a soapbox, but maybe at this point, have I, have I done my like, my, my intro and then we'll pass it around. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, uh, just just so everybody is on uh, board, we've got our fourth panelist, Ali Al-Khatib here. I'm gonna actually have Mauricio do his bit and then I will introduce Ali and have him give his his sort of introductory uh, spiel um, uh, just to kind of keep the flow of things. So uh, Mauricio, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, that sounds good. Thank you so much, uh, Ari and Catherine, uh, and to my other co-panelists for the opportunity to talk about uh, my interest and my work. Um, um, as Ari mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in the joint program. I come to um, the sciences. Actually, I was an under I was a philosophy undergraduate major, um, and uh, when I went into theology and philosophy, and then later on into um, theology as a PhD. Um, one of the things that I found was that, you know, I was deeply dissatisfied with the way that ethicists and bioethicists were talking about 
um, negotiating the complexities of human life. Um, and so one of the things, one of the places that I looked was to the social sciences for places where the conversations felt more robust, where um, uh, the divide between the theoretical and the applied um, was being refused um, in, in really creative ways. And that really brought me to the program at uh, Berkeley and UCSF uh, to work with social scientists who were really trying to think um, differently about some of the inherited categories and inherited assumptions about what it meant to be human, about what a policy could look like, um, about um, the life of data, right? Uh, so I come to data science uh, by way of, you know, science studies, by way of ethnographic and qualitative engagement with scientists, um, attentive to issues of professionalization, attentive to issues of reputation, attentive to issues of technical expertise. Um, and in my field, it's really important to talk about, um, you know, what it means to do qualitative research on the institutions and norms relevant for understanding the current dispensation of global health, of epidemiology, of how things um, get funded, of how interventions get funded. Um, because it, it's very difficult to talk about health without talking about evidence-based statistical measures um, that determine whether or not uh, something gets uh, the money that it needs to address uh, the issue at hand, to talk about experimental research platforms like randomized control trials and cost-effective rubrics. Um, all of these really shape uh, possibilities um, within which something like health and disease uh, emerge, make sense to some people, don't make sense to others. Um, I work in substance use disorder <laughs> and trying to make numbers in this field is notoriously difficult. And people have a lot of confidence in their proxies. Um, and so having conversations with epidemiologists about what counts as a valid proxy, what it actually means, and with my interlocutors who are people who use drugs about what it means to feel like a number, right? To be represented in a certain way. These numbers and these indicators and key performance indicators are not just these transparent um, reflections of the world, but instead are tied to the careers of politicians and bureaucrats, are tied to health officials in very complicated ways. Um, and being able to have more subtle and nuanced fine grain conversations about what that means on the ground for policy decisions, um, uh, particularly in South Asia, which is where I work, um, is very, very important. Um, I landed in, uh, in I landed in Delhi in February of 2020. <laughs> and, um, and what that means is that I got to have a front row seat at one response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Right, and the role of data and the role of data in terms of government responses um, was incredibly important to think carefully about, about what those numbers actually mean, about what it means to count a, a certain number of people, what it means um, in terms of who is sick, who is not sick, um, who died. Um, you know, interviewing journalists who were out there in the cremation grounds actually counting the number of fires. Um, felt very, very important to my interlocutors to sort of bring to the foreground um, and how that was a mismatch between official number, you know, official government data. So really looking at issues of power are very, very key to understanding what it means to uh, produce data, to produce a certain kind of expertise, to produce not only experts, but the objects of that expertise. Um, I... Uh, I come to data as kind of someone who is eager to learn uh, from people with much more technical expertise. Um, but I also come with certain commitments that come from my training as an anthropologist and as a social scientist um, that uh, I, I refuse to be naive. I refuse to accept certain things as just givens. Um, and uh, this will be something that I bring about later, but really the notion that um, the key to the life of data in practice is contestation, right? Um, is conversation, is debate, is wondering how we got here, what it means, who's represented, whether or not they're consenting. Um, consent is a very, very big issue in anthropology. And we've, we've come to consider consent to being represented in a data set a lot like consent to being in any kind of research project 
um, as a relationship and not just a, a box that you tick off in terms of liability. Um, and so being sensitive to these issues of consent and recognizing that representation is much, much more um, than, uh, than something that is received or inherited is super, super important. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about my background, but that's kind of uh, why I've come to this conversation. I'll, I'll say one last thing is that um, uh, epidemiological and public health sensibilities really shape um, our expectations of what we what we hope numbers will do in the world. Um, and my current you know, research is on the, um, the kind of harmony between criminology and epidemiology that is really the matrix within which substance use, uh, epidemi uh, substance use epidemiology is being crafted, right? It's these intuitions from very, very different disciplines that converge and make a certain kind of knowledge about um, uh, people who are both um, considered to be sick and considered to be criminal, right? Um, and so you have a lot of cooperation between policing, surveillance, uh, public health officials, clinical officials to create this kind of data um, that has a huge impact on policy decisions, both in the United States and in other parts of the world. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Mauricio. Um, so now I will belatedly introduce, thankfully we've uh, uh, taken care of some technical difficulties. I'll introduce our final panelist, uh, Ali Al-Khatib. Um, and then after I introduce you, Ali, please just kind of give your introductory spiel before we move in uh, into questions. So a quick introduction on my part for him. Uh, Ali is currently the interim director of the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco. Uh, before, before that, uh, he had studied computer science at Stanford for a few years, uh, part of pursuing a PhD. Currently, his work focuses on human-computer interaction, but with a kind of twist, you know, looking at how people relate to individual algorithmic systems that are not just system, you know, technical systems, but those that are part of, embedded in, and constitutive of uh, social contexts, and works to bring theoretical lenses and frameworks originating in the social sciences to help better understand uh, these phenomena and what's at stake in them. He's written some really incredible essays on, uh, just for a few examples, on how gig work disempowers workers, uh, why uh, AI makes so many frustrating errors at the margins, uh, and another on how the power AIs wield can allow them to get increasingly unhinged from the reality we live in. Thank you, Ali, for being here um, and excited to uh, hear from you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that's, um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, I want to thank everybody for for coming to this panel. Um, my name, as, uh, as stated, is uh, Ali, and I'm the director for the Center for Applied Data Ethics at the University of San Francisco. And um, I kind of just wanted to like sort of unpack the path of frustration that led me to kind of where I am, because I think or I hope that there's some parallel there for a lot of you who are studying either computer science or data science or just generally thinking about how you can use technology to build things to make the world a better place. Um, I, as as stated, I started from a, sort of from a background in anthropology. Um, I did field work and digs in Central and South America. Um, I like worked in archaeological labs where we were doing all these analyses and all this other stuff. Um, but fundamentally, what I was thinking about was how people kind of made sense of and made their way through the world. And the thing that I wanted to study and the reason that I went to uh, computer science after my undergrad was because I wanted to make sense of how people mediated by technology uh, were making sense of the world and making culture together. And uh, what we were finding over the years was that a lot of the theories that we were gravitating towards in trying to think of sort of how we can build technologies that will help workers or just people more broadly to uh, coalesce their power and to achieve things together, the theories that we were tapping into were often theories uh, that were fairly, let's say, fairly well honed and fairly well established in the social sciences and in the humanities. Um, and in particular, a lot of the stuff that I felt was fairly foundational to anthropology and the social sciences was kind of revelatory stuff in HCI. Um, 
And so the sort of trajectory of my work in the past couple of years has been trying to make sense of a lot of the theories that I think are somewhat well established in the social sciences, uh, things um, like looking at piecework as a way to make sense of gig work and crowd work, or looking at street level, or sorry, yes, uh, street level bureaucrats, this theory by Michael Lipsky, to try to make sense of why algorithmic systems make all these frustrating decisions at the margins. Uh, or to think about bureaucratic theory more broadly to make sense of why algorithmic systems kind of don't see us for who we are and instead sort of simplify and uh, flatten us into these uh, two-dimensional kind of figures of tables and whatnot. But I think that ultimately, like the, under, the undercurrent of what I've been thinking about has basically been um, I'm coming from a field that has a lot of history, a lot of baggage, um, has accomplished some things, has like figured out how to make sense of some phenomena and things like that. Uh, but basically what I want to do is help a new field like computer science, like HCI, like AI and machine learning, uh, try to not make the same mistakes that the social sciences has made over the years. Uh, mistakes including allying itself with power uh, to the detriment and to the harm of the people we ostensibly want to study and learn from and help. Um, and the entire narrative of helping and everything like that is its own sort of thing that we should we should pause and reflect on. Um, and so over the last, I guess, two years or so since I joined the Center for Applied Data Ethics, the main thing that I've been thinking about has been how to convey a lot of the sort of thinking that kind of goes on uh, on an everyday basis in the social sciences and how to convey that to computer scientists, to data scientists, to people who are thinking kind of like all of us about how we can use the tools that we have, the knowledge that we have, the techniques that we know to, again, to make the world a different place than it was yesterday, to make the world hopefully a more just place than it was yesterday. Um, and so that's sort of the overarching thought that I have had over the last couple of years and sort of the crystallized form uh, to talk to you all about. Um, as, as Mauricio and everybody else has probably said, I'm really excited to get into this conversation with all of you and to chat about, uh, I guess, sort of like how history, how the social sciences, how lenses on human nature can help to inform the sort of stuff that we're seeing in the kind of collection of data, the use of data, the, the use of that data for machine learning systems or AI or systems in general that make decisions about people's lives. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, so now we're going to transition into a, uh, just a, a handful of, of questions that I have for the panelists uh, to kind of get the ball rolling before we open things up uh, to the audience for questions. Uh, now, the first question I want to pose is, and this is just to remind you, the, the, really the purpose of this panel is to think about what's involved in actually working uh, with uh, technically oriented students, whether in data science or related disciplines, what's involved in, in teaching them with some of the, the, the some of the perspectives and ways of thinking that we've already sort of touched on a little bit. So really prioritizing what's the value added, what's what are students supposed to take away uh, from the kind of work that we all do. So what I'm going to ask each panelist now to talk about for a little bit is to to describe and think through and discuss one sort of key point or key learning objective uh, concerning what, what we refer to as human context and ethics of data that we, you know, that, that, that the panelists think is particularly crucial for a student in, in data science uh, or again, related discipline to take away uh, with them. Like if there's like one key thing you really like, this is something I think it's really crucial to understand. Uh, what is it? How do you get them to think about it? Uh, and why do you think it's so important? Um, so with that, I'm actually, I'm gonna stick with this alphabetical order thing and, and we'll just kind of go right back uh, to Ali uh, and then um, Morgan and then Catherine and then Mauricio. Um, so um, Ali, go ahead. Cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, so I think like you asked about, you asked us to sort of think about like what one thing do we want to, like would we want to shout from the rooftops if we could? Uh, and, and like the thing that I've sort of like been really stuck on has been uh, this like, I guess like this like promise that sometimes people will make and sometimes startups will make and all this other stuff of like debiasing data or debiasing algorithmic systems. And I really want to like drill down or like hammer home or whatever the phrase is uh, that it is impossible to debias data. It's impossible to debias the, the context in which a data set were, was collected. Uh, and that like it's similarly impossible to debias a classification system or really any system whatsoever. Uh, 
that being said, that doesn't mean that like you should be kind of like hopeless for what you can do with a with a data set or what have you. But instead, what you should do is try to acknowledge the bias or acknowledge the context in which the data set was generated and try to understand and kind of contextualize uh, under what circumstances were these data uh, collected and measured? Um, under what circumstances were the people who are represented by the data, if there is anything vaguely like that? Um, like, under what circumstances did they cons uh, consent to, if they consented uh, to the collection of that data? And what are the limitations that these contexts mean for uh, the use that you have in mind for, let's say, training a machine learning system or, or doing some sort of uh, any sort of application with it. Um, while it is impossible to kind of remove all context from data or from a system or from what, whatever, you can figure out sort of like how far you think that you can take the use of this data or how far you think or what sort of uses and contexts you feel comfortable or safe or just sort of foundationally, like fundamentally sort of grounded in uh, using the data for whatever purpose. Um, to the credit of like the machine learning or AI community, I think that there are people like Tim Nickebru who uh, have have made this like data sheets for data sets uh, kind of like paper that basically describes this idea of contextualizing data. And I think I come at it from a slightly different perspective as an anthropologist who like like where in the past of my sort of like uh, sort of academic career, we were literally digging things out of the ground. And there was this understanding that if you brought something back in like the kind of uh, the stereotypical archaeological plastic bag of of shards and things like that, if you didn't have a tag associated with it that said exactly how deep in the ground it was, exactly which unit it was, down to the meter, um, and the depth down to the centimeter, uh, if you didn't have all of the surrounding context of where this piece came from, then it was basically worthless. And I really want to sort of instill that into the minds of data scientists, that it's not that I'm sort of like a Luddite or something like that about all data and that I don't want to use data at all or anything like that, but that we really need to be much more careful about uh, how we catalog and how we annotate and collect data and understand the limitations therein. Thank you, Ali Morgan. Great. Um, thank you. That's such a great setup and such an important message, one that I, I certainly heartily echo. Um, Gosh, you know, I'm thinking through the uh, all the various lessons um, in the class I teach. I think is most relevant um, one I teach regularly in the Masters in Data Science program called "Behind the Data Humans and Values." Um, what Ali just described is certainly one of those messages, and I had a really hard time narrowing down. But I think one I'd like to talk about um, that's really so fundamental to data science and to statistics more broadly is uh, classification. And it's something that is um, often taken for granted, you, you know, even by data scientists, they, they either kind of accept the classification schemas that they are given, or they will apply one kind of out there from the world, right, an objective one. Um, but one of the things that I really want to work on with my students, um, and and I, you know, hear back from them later that it was really useful, is um, exploring the messy reality behind those discrete categories and classifications that we employ when we do data science um, and that these automated systems put in place right and, and reinforce um, so Catherine already talked a bit about how the development of statistics and statistical models really can't be divorced from the struggle for state power right so again statistics comes from the power of the state idea of counting accounting for people within maybe a given territory or within the purview of a given institution um, and the desire to count and classify and categorize rises out of a desire um, of governments and other institutions like churches um, to count its members for various reasons, right? Taxation, purposes of military conscription. Um, and of course, counting large swaths of diverse people has never been easy. Um, you know, there's huge, really obvious questions that come up right away. Who do we count? why um, there are issues of inclusion, counting some people and not counting others, categorizing some people in some way and categorizing others in other ways. Um, and a lot of this came into stark relief during European colonial expansion. Um, and so often there would be this, you know, this uh, counting of colonizers and those who were colonized, right? Um, and in the US, we also saw a lot of tension around counting um, the enslaved population, enslaved people in the US and enslavers or those who, who were not enslaved. Um, 
So looking at this history uh, reminds us that while there's a practical purpose for categorizing, accounting, and classifying, there's also a dimension of control, um, as, as both Ali and Mauricio have also highlighted. Um, so we can understand these classifications and practice of data science and statistics as not only an accounting for the world, but also shaping it. Once we make distinctions that some people are, say, citizens and other people aren't, we're producing a particular vision of the world. And there are many ways we could slice up that social world. Every time we make a decision, we are closing off possible ways that we could understand a given population, a given, a given question. So one of the consequences of this is that this amorphous, fluid, even conflicting identities that we all have become solidified and reified in classification schemes and records and databases. Um, so in the best case, classification systems, as Ali said, hold a memory of the work that has been done, whether it's in the laboratory or organizational, epidemiological, sociological, um, and then permit um, people to kind of have a due process, right, for future work. Um, but often classification systems, um, especially ones that we take for granted, don't have that, right? Um, so I want to take a close look in particular at gender as one. Gender assumptions are, of course, really deeply embedded in Western culture and in the global North, I would say. And thinking, you know, we might think about all the products we encounter that are gendered throughout the day, um, sometimes really without needing to be in any way. Um, we can think about all the times that we're asked our gender, right? It's on all of our important identity documents. Often it's asked when we open a new account, right? Um, and many cultures around the world have a lot more complicated understanding of gender. But this Western understanding often gets codified into classification systems because those classification systems are often built by people embedded in the West or by Western states themselves. Um, so there's a small but very important part of the population for whom gender assignment at birth, um, sex assignment, um, don't fit. There's some who feel that they've been putting the wrong category, right? This has come to be called the transgender or trans community. Some prefer other terms for that identification, but that's, that's one that's been used a lot. And then there are some who feel that they really don't fit in either of the two commonly used categories. Um, they may use non-binary or gender fluid, gender queer, other terms. And there's a really robust body of scholarship from the social scientists that have shown the many ways that gender is social, socially constructed and is fluid, right? Um, so this, of course, can chafe against categorization systems, which tend to be pretty rigid in how they ask these kinds of things. So for the estimated 9 to 12 million non-binary people in the world, and that's probably a, an underestimate, um, this seemingly simple request to select gender in a system can be really difficult to answer, if it can really be answered at all, right? Yet in creating an online user account or applying for a passport, the choice between male or female and only those two are often the only options, right? Even in the US, this has only recently been shifted. Um, and these options or lack thereof have consequences. If you refuse to register non-binary people with birth certificates and then exclude them in everything from creating bank accounts to signing up for mailing lists, you do not have the right to turn around and say that there are not enough of them to warrant change. But on the other hand, counting or asking is not always an unmitigated good either. That can also have unintended consequences, sometimes really bad ones for marginalized groups, right? Um, trans, transgender people, for example, may prefer not to disclose the sex they were assigned at birth, keeping their identity as a trans person private, and that is their right. Even for those who generally choose to make their trans identity public, being visibly identified as trans on a map or on a database um, could expose them to discrimination, to violence. Um, even in a big data set, there is no additional strength in numbers necessarily, um, because often these groups are small enough, they are more exposed and more vulnerable. So I will sum things up right there, but that's a, a flavor of one of the topics I really enjoy diving into with students. And they always just, you know, it's, it's one of those many kind of mind blowing moments that we have in the class that I just, I just really revel in. Great, thank you so much, Morgan, uh, for sharing that what's I think for us to a really, really rich and important kind of area of, of inquiry and, and, and pedagogy. Um, Catherine. Would you like to go next? OK, I'll stand up again and project. I, I really appreciated what Morgan just said. Um, 
I, every time a binary gender data set shows up in data eight or data 100, I personally feel it's my responsibility to say gender is not binary. And I know that because I have a kid who's not binary and I've been working with them and I'm sure they'd be fine with my saying this, like over the last three years, realizing how uncomfortable they would personally feel in a data science class that just assumed gender binary. Um, and I think for each of those categorization systems, we should be thinking about the experience of students who are in classes who feel like this is not representing my identity it's erasing it. So forgive me if that was not ex exactly what I was feeling like saying, but it was like, you know, holding my transgender kid when they decided like, it's not safe for me to go to college in Ohio and holding them on Friday when the Dobbs decision came down and just feeling like this categorization of people into safe and not safe is so politically poisonous that when we teach data science, we actually have to take it on ourselves to query the categories that were given and say, what has been left out? Whose experiences were not taken into account when the category system was set up? And maybe that does transition to the point that, forgive me, that, I mean, that one's still very close to home with my kid and me. Um, to, to the sort of more general point I'd like to make about things that I try to make accessible and intelligible to my data science students, something that they can come out of this somewhat historically inflected class that we teach to them at Berkeley um, about this notion of statistics originating as a science of the state looking from above and wondering, you know, like, how is it possible to combine the power that comes with abstraction and mathematization of stripping away the human details with the actual responsibility to the people in the data? So I try to help them to see like the view from above is a particular view. It's not the only view and on its own, the view from above, the abstracted view that just makes people into numbers, puts the data science, data scientist at risk of doing harm, even unintentionally. So in that situation where you're like acknowledging that your tendency as a data scientist is to look for like the best possible data set that allows you to get the most comprehensive overview, sort of like a sovereign of the state looking down. What do you as a practicing data scientist want to need to do to get the view from below? So this is a, a kind of um, common theme in science and technology studies since about the 1980s. And there's a beautiful piece by Donna Haraway, one of the original feminist intersectionalists so STS scholars who pointed out the notion of knowledge from below and what she called the privilege of partial perspective. That not being the sort of unmarked godlike figure looking down from above, but being a person who lives a life gives you knowledge and expertise that also needs to be part of the conversation. Knowledge from below needs to meet with knowledge from above. And where the rubber hits the road for, for data science students learning how to do this is to think like every time you get a data set that tries to be global, to look from above, whose perspective, whose experience, whose knowledge do you need to go out and solicit in order to count, counter it and combine it with the view from below? So there's a whole set of, um, practices around community engaged scholarship, community based research that we try to bring to data scientists just as something that you need to learn how to do. Even though in our data science program, we don't in fact train you how to do that. We train you how to do the view from above, but you need to go out and learn how to actually meet with the people who you are studying and understand what they know about your data set that you don't because knowledge from above only goes part of the way and you need to learn how to meet it with knowledge from below that is anchored in respect and responsibility 
to those communities rather than sort of taking the position of, I stand above and therefore I know better than you do. So we think that's a really good and powerful compliment to this set of tools and abstractions that are at the heart of data science that allow you to move across domains, that there's real power in the knowledge from above and that it's necessary to solicit from below. So that, that's not exactly the historian's perspective, but that's one of the things as someone who's been in STS for 30, 35 years that I continue to carry with me the power of partial perspective. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Mauricio. Um, thank you very much. I have the privilege of going last, <laughs> which is a really great one. Um, what I'll say is that I, so I come to this panel as having been the head GSI, so the head graduate student instructor for Data 104. Um, and one of the biggest opportunities was the fact that we got to coordinate and collaborate with other graduate student instructors from across the university. So we had people from nuclear engineering, we had people from the School of Information, from city planning, from anthropology, from history, uh, from data science. Um, and in our meetings, we were able to talk about what our different expertises meant for the different topics that came up in Data 104. And uh, what I want to talk about and what I would shout from the rooftops is about expertise. Right, that expertise, as we talk about in the course, and as as people have mentioned in various ways in this session, is domain specific, right? And so this idea that because I have technical capacity to be able to analyze a data set, I know about the object <laughs> of that data set is a fallacy, right? Um, and it's an overextension. It's overreach. Um, and it can create opportunities uh, for profound kinds of harm. And so this notion of being able to collaborate across disciplines is so, so vital. Um, just because expertise really determines what counts as a problem or an object of concern. So um, students you know, at Berkeley have chafed at the notion that um, often in some of their data science classes, they're being asked to think about how there is a population bomb in some country in the global south that is reproducing at massive rates and that we must all be concerned because there is a scarcity of resources and we must use our expertise as data scientists to understand what's going on with those brown people over there and why they're causing a global problem. And if you frame it like that, it's kind of easy to see why some people can be profoundly offended, why you might um, not be creating an atmosphere where people want to even become data scientists, right? Because the questions are deeply racist right? and have to do with a long history of um, family planning, of eugenics, of American intervention in other countries. Um, and so when you're able to bring to bear uh, knowledge about histories, knowledge about uh, global policy, then you're able to see how certain problems become problems for certain people, right? Because of certain motivations. And when you historicize that way, you're like, okay, let's bring to bear some of our knowledge as historians or sociologists or anthropologists or you know, technical uh, data scientists to think about what, um, what is really at stake in the kinds of claims that we make about the data that we have and how we might go about collecting data that would be more useful to certain people, particularly people who don't have power. And by power, I mean money. <laughs> so money tends to be something that shapes, um, particularly in global health, particularly in um, religious institutions that fund certain interventions, particularly in things like the Gates Foundation. Um, so naming names is really important. So understanding that these large public-private partnerships that determine global health priorities um, is incredibly important. Um, and figuring out that, you know, who counts as an expert really matters. And I draw here on uh, the tradition that comes out of disability studies um, as a discipline, which is the principle of nothing about us without us, right? 
It's this notion that those who are the most affected by policy are the experts. If you're going to be creating data sets about unhoused people, about people who use drugs, about people who um, have abortions, right? That those affected most by the policy are the experts. That to not include them at the very beginning of any kind of research project is to do malpractice, um, not to put too fine a point on it. So um, that's what I wanted to bring is the notion of um, what we try to encourage our students to think about more critically and more robustly is this notion of expertise and recognizing that um, no one can be an expert in all the things. Um, I've tried, it's horrible. <laughs> like, and um, uh, what I found is just a deep sense of humility at the things I can't know. And the fact is that in, in my discipline, the single author monograph is still the standard, right? We believe, we have this illusion that, you know, single authors are the people who produce knowledge when in fact, the most exciting research comes from collaboration, comes from debate, um, and engagement across disciplines where people don't have to convert to another discipline. They can stay in their own and have productive conversations given their gifts, given their talents, given their training um, to create better science. Wonderful. Thank you, Mauricio and, and everybody for this kind of first round of, of, uh, of questions. Uh, what I want to do next, one more thing before opening up, uh, I think a broader conversation is ask a question, and some of you I think touched on it already, so um, if you don't feel like you have something additional to add, that's that's fine, but uh, to, to particularly draw attention to the, the special tools or methods or expertises, uh, knowledges that you really specifically bring to your teaching, um, and what does that sort of, that that particular background, those, which tool or method or perspective um, that you bring, like, what is that and what exactly does that bring uh, to student learning outcomes? Um, I'm not gonna actually, rather than just going alphabetically, I'm just gonna ask you to, you know, those of you who feel like you have something additional to add to just speak up, uh, or if you have maybe even a kind of related reflection related to what somebody else said, feel free to kind of jump in with that. Um, so just unmute yourself uh, or Catherine, just get up and speak if you'd like to, like to address this prompt. I'm, I'm happy to jump in if that's okay. <laughs> um, so uh, just like there's a benefit of going last, there might be a little bit of benefit going first. Um, so, so as I said before, I lean heavily on SDS um, and I really find it useful to bring my technical understandings, my own experiences um, working in the tech world, um, going through a computer science undergraduate program, knowing the kinds of lessons that that they told us at least in that particular program um, about the power of abstraction, right? And there was a, a concomitant kind of tacit understanding that, that we were the smartest people in the room. We didn't necessarily have to talk with other people, right? Um, and this I find uh, really harmful. I Hopefully all of our messages are kind of reinforcing that point, right? And it ultimately doesn't it doesn't uh, serve students well, right? Um, so bringing that technical understanding in with the social understanding, um, I tend to uh, lean fairly heavily on technical examples, um, but frame it in a really with a social science sensibility. So one way that I do this is even in the introduction to the course, I tend to talk about what we cover throughout the, the semester we have together as a little bit like learning a language. Um, we all come in with pieces of this language, right? We come in with lived experiences. We might come in with different undergraduate experiences, different work experiences. Um, a lot of the people coming into this master's in data science program at Berkeley are, um, are working professionals. They've been out in the tech field for a while and, um, and you know, have, have really a lot that they bring into the classroom that I learned from them. Um, at the same time, learning to think like a social scientist really requires them to take a step back and and structure you know again leaning on this language metaphor structure a new vocabulary in their head structure a new way of looking at the world and i tell them to take the time to really do that they might feel um a little bit like i think many of my uh, my sts friends and colleagues felt right around the third year of grad school a little bit of an existential crisis right of like what are we doing how do we know anything you know what how how can we ever 
really draw a line in the sand. Um, one thing though, I tried to tell my students is that, you know, even taking a step back and saying, you know, I'm not going to take a stance on this is taking a stance, right? That's going with the status quo, um, which is often one that reinforces those in power already. And so I say, we're going to be making, we're going to be drawing that line some way or another. The best thing to do is to take some time to really understand multiple perspectives, build up that vocabulary. You don't get to fluency after one semester though, right? What I hope is that they come out of my class or, um, or you know, the class that Catherine and um, Ari and Mauricio have, have taught with a good working vocabulary, with a good structure onto which they can continue to build. And, um, and I think this is one thing that I was very conscious of in graduate school, again, coming from a technical background um, that I really had to construct. Um, I didn't necessarily have it. I had a keen interest. I had a a wealth of lived experiences that primed me to want to study that, which is why I went in that direction at all, rather than just into the tech world, which was a, would have been the default. But I didn't have the language for it, literally or figuratively. Um, and so, you know, one way I, I uh, open this up is to talk about um, a wonderful book called A Vast Machine by Paul Edwards um, that shows the way that climate science data um, is absolutely reliable, but it's inextricably tied to the types of instruments, the extent of the instrument networks, the models used to measure it. And all of these in turn have been influenced by global geopolitical, historical, and technological trends over the last over hundred years now. Um, climate scientists work hard to understand and account for all of those difference between different instrument types and the results they have collectively generated generated are absolutely re reliable. Um, he describes it as shimmering around a consistent, a consistent message, right? But the politics of that data collection have shaped not only the science, but the public's often somewhat facile, sadly, reaction to it. Um, Lisa Gittleman has also put out an excellent edited collection on this topic called Raw Data is an Oxymoron and just really dives into this different way of looking at the world, different way of looking at data. Um, you know, one thing we ask over and over in my class is if data science produces something useful, it's useful for whom? Useful when? Useful why? And at whose expense? Who's left out? Um, so we can think about this subjective position not as a weakness or as a limitation or as something, as Elise said, we can subtract out magically, but it's an inexorable part of science and of data science. And knowledge of it is actually a strength. And it's important then to recognize that just simply having that perspective, developing that language doesn't invalidate the science that you're doing. It doesn't invalidate the work that, um, that data scientists do, um, but it does remind us that we need to pay close attention to the politics and to the subjective limitations of our particular perspectives. All right, sorry, that was a little bit of a soapbox, but. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Thank Morgan. That's that's what <laughs> this is kind of a soapbox. Set. We've all got our soapboxes here. <laughs> um, any, any does anyone else have a response to this prompt or something else that's kind of nagging and on your mind? Oh, Mauricio. Um, I'll just I'll be very very brief. I mean, I think one of the most important things um, that people can do is look at what the social scientists are saying about certain kinds of data sets that they're using. I mean, people. Um, have been really, really prolific in examining um, the, the kind of politics and production of numbers and data, of going into laboratories, of going into um, different places to understand how this gets made. Um, and there are medical anthropologists, medical soci... I mean, I, I, I talk basically about health, so I'm sorry about that. But like looking carefully at medical anthropologists, medical sociologists who are deeply engaged with the scientists producing this stuff. So whether we're talking about um, Crystal Burek's book on cooking data in Africa, or uh, Vin Sands Adams' work on metrics. Um, and then the, the critique, which is a much broader critique of humanitarianism and the kinds of violence that humanitarianism can do. Um, you know, the, this, the do-gooder, the good intention, um, and really sort of tracking the life of that good intention as it goes through all the translations has been something that social scientists have been very attentive to. Um, and so really saying, you know, who is writing, who is doing the research on, you know, RCTs and economics? Um, who is doing that kind of work where they're interviewing the scientists and the people being interviewed? 
Um, I will say that um, really thinking critically about what a survey is, what an ethnographic interview is, what the what assumptions are embedded in it, um, who who's done it and how. Um, all of these are things that um, qualitative researchers have had to think about for a very long time. Um, and it is deeply, deeply relevant for um, understanding experimental psychology and how certain kinds of design systems in um, you know, online socio-technical systems are developed um, and what kinds of assumptions about the human mind about habit and desire are embedded in those kinds of things. Um, and so really like finding an anthropological or a socio-scientific vocabulary for talking about the assumptions about the human and the, the animal um, are really what, what having a conversation with a social scientist can do, you know, down the hall or in another building in your university. Thank you, Mauricio. This... Anyone, Ali? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm sort of echoing some of the thoughts that both Morgan and Mauricio stated, but um, I think that like a set of experiences, I suppose, that have uh, really informed how I try to like, or the sort of thoughts that I try to teach people. Oh, um, I'll just let it, hopefully it'll be fine. Uh, uh, has been, uh, I don't want to say to be credulous, but to believe people when they uh, tell you a story about what they've experienced or when they tell you about their experiences broadly. Um, and something that sort of like informs that is uh, like when I was in uh, 2015, when I was working as an intern at Microsoft Research, we were working on like sort of worker cooperative sort of systems and trying to build a system for drivers or domestic workers. We weren't totally sure which yet. And I heard so many stories from Uber drivers who were saying, who were telling me this story about how uh, some group of Uber drivers had been meeting at a bar after they were driving to discuss possibly unionizing or something like that. And that eventually Uber figured it out and then uh, suspended all of these drivers. And I never found the drivers who supposedly were suspended. I never found evidence that that was, I never found objective evidence that that was true, but it was true enough that the people who I talked to and the people who volunteered this story to me were willing to act on it as though it were true. And so in some sense, it became sort of immaterial whether it was true or not. There are so many things going on outside, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so these are the sorts of things that I think are really important that never show up in any data set really, unless you're actually going and talking to people on the ground. And I think it's incredibly important to really emphasize the importance of one, talking to people, listening to them and trusting them and believing them. And then two, sort of valuing that as an entire form of knowledge that you can't necessarily get trivially or easily from any data set that you might want to tap into. Thank you, Ali. Catherine, can I mind? can I just be brief? I mean, you Please. and I'll, I'll try. Um, you and I have worked with Margot to try to develop like the human context and ethics toolkit, which was a metaphor of a toolkit that I took on with a lot of concern. I mean, one of the things I learned working with nuclear engineers is if I say I have tools, they will work with me. And if I don't say I have tools that I just have questions, they'll shut me out. So we decided when we set up this course that we would like adopt that engineering mindset of like your builders, you need tools and take them at their word that that was what they needed and try to boil down, you know, 35 years of history and STS in my case into a set of tools that we could simply say like, and, and we even boil them down further. Like now there are like four main lenses that we have students practice. And there's more than that that we want them to learn, but the four are always look for how power is shifting. Always look for narrative, for the stories that are being told that connect the past to the present. Always look for identity and positionality, yours and the data subjects. And always look for the ways in which there's no clear distinction between what's social and what's technical. Like your tool is look for these things so that you can see them in that sense, they're lenses, and then figure out where you have agency, where you have space to sort of intervene along those axes with those tools. 
like if you're recognizing that there's a story being told, a narrative that, you know, a particular technology is inevitable, it's coming, we just have to adapt, then you know that like, that's a story people tell. It's just a story. It's not likely to be true. You have to recognize that it's a story rather than reality and then analyze it as a story to figure out like, okay, so it's like, who does this serve or where are the points where it might actually be movable? So figuring out how to essentially meet our students where they are, they want tools and yet take a whole body of broader social scientific and humanistic knowledge and give them to them. That, that's been one of our experiments in the course. Um, so I, I guess that's part, I mean, you asked about the special tools and expertise that we have, and we're already using the language of tools because that's this audience. Great, thank you, Catherine, and to everybody so far. So uh, we've got another 20 minutes left, and I'd like to use that to open things up to all of you here in the room and all of you uh, connecting uh, virtually uh, to ask questions you have uh, uh, relevant to this panel and to these panelists that you'd like to know about what's involved in getting social scientists of various sorts involved in conversations about teaching data science. Um, so yeah, I see a hand right here. So human concepts, human concepts of human have been evolving for centuries. Uh, we were looking at the word two dimensional and then the uh, well, two dimension, four dimension, and now that there's a story of three dimensions. Uh, how can we uh, ensure that our research methods are quantitative, qualitative, such as two party How can we actually make sure that uh, we don't have a very uh, naive view of the world that only one man will explain human consciousness and human knowledge? And the sort of that, how do we actually make sure that the things that describe Okay, so the, the, the question I'm just so everybody can hear it is and, and correct me if I've, I've gotten it wrong, but how do we make sure that the tools that we use as social scientists to teach these things sort of keep up with the sort of rapid evolution of human consciousness and society and the rap, rapid change, rap, rapid changes in society? That's a big one. Does someone online want to take that? I mean, Rishi, I, go I, ahead. You're. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll just not enthusiastic. I think Ari and Catherine are extraordinary in being connected to uh, news stories and popular conversations and Twitter and Twitter threads and just staying on top of what's most relevant for the, the concerns of the students coming in. We have students answer questions about what they're really concerned about walking in. And I think it was two years ago, y'all talked about how it was elections, right? And so that was the very big thing about data science and election, you know, um, uh, issues around that. And that completely changed when we taught it this past spring, people were not concerned about it as much. Um, in, they were concerned about very, very different things. And so having, being willing to use journalism uh, creatively um, in your course about data science is, I think, fundamental. Um, being able to collaborate with journalists is key. I would follow up on that. Um, so I, I would actually push back a little bit on, <laughs> on uh, you know, the, the rapid change of society, rapid change of technology. I think things are changing. I'm not saying that, that uh, the, they are not, um, but I would say that what drives us, what motivates us, what concerns us as humans in a society in relation to one another has actually not changed that much. You know, the ways that we might go about it have changed. Um, you know, certainly the ways that we stay connected. You know, I have my phone here just in case my kids uh, summer camp calls to, to say there's some issue, right? Like the way that we're connected changes, but the kind of, you know, relationships and obligations we have to one another, to a particular place, perhaps, um, that that is part of the human condition. So I would say that the way I teach the class, um, I have a number of case studies that I update, um, much as, as uh, Mauricio described. Um, 
for uh, for Data 104, um, I update those depending on um, you know student interest, student concerns. Um, you know, one that I've been wrestling with a bit with uh, this summer um, is. Uh, you know, abortion privacy. This is something students are just like, whoa, okay, how do we think about this? How, you know, how do we, as data scientists, how can we help this? Um, and I, I love that. And I love kind of steering things towards that. But, you know, the, the overall framework for thinking about um, human rights and privacy and, um, and what matters to us, right? What kinds of protections might need to be in place for various corporations I haven't actually changed that much. So I, the case studies change, but a lot of the fundamentals are actually kind of evergreen, I would say. You know, I teach with some texts from the 80s because they still resound so well with students. And then I just have newer case studies that we say, okay, let's think through this text from the 80s. Or we read about, you know, technologies from the 1920s or the 1840s, and then we apply it to contemporary case studies. Yeah, I, I wanted to like say something very similar to that. I, I feel like I want to like I want to echo everybody <laughs> with all these answers. Um, I think that one of the most persuasive or most powerful things about a lot of the tools or techniques or whatever you want to say in the social sciences is that uh, they are not rote devices. Um, they're not things to be memorized and then sort of like uh, like reiterated verbatim. Um, they're supposed to be flexible. They're supposed to be things that you use with the critical mind that you bring with you uh, to any new situation. And so just like Morgan was saying, um, like whenever there is, I mean, there, every every current event becomes the subject of some sort of inquiry that you can apply a lens onto and say, okay, well, how does this lens that we have from the 1980s or even earlier, um, how does this bring this thing that's happening right now into focus, into focus in a different way than other lenses do? Um, I mean, this is why I think like the social sciences has theories, like, has so many theories uh, in it, like the, especially like these ontological theories that are sort of like difficult to keep track of and all this other stuff, because these theories are useful because they elicit texture in the picture that you're trying to make sense of uh, that can't be fal falsified. Like it, it brings certain things into focus and it shifts certain things out of focus in a way that is useful to an analyst. Um, and so I think that it's not necessarily, like Morgan was saying, it's not necessarily that things change in a way that makes these theories less useful, but that it does make it challenging to like figure out, okay, well, how can I make, how can I show sort of like the usefulness of all of these tools, all of these lenses that can bring all of this stuff into focus in different ways um, that, that can show people the like, Rev, like the relevance of of what's like of what we're trying to teach but it is difficult because uh it's not like a python library or something where you can import it and then just like trust that there's a right way to use it and follow the documentation or something like that like it can be it can be challenging you have that response no Okay, um, let's see. I wanted to check it. There's, I know, one question online, but I'd like to get at least one more um, uh, from the room. So, right over here. Yeah, so um, I, I think you know, there's all this conversation about um, context and perspectives and all sorts of stuff is really important. Um, uh, one concern that I have is with it, kind of putting all this within the curriculum and the courses uh, is that you know, things kind of go through the rigorous data science curriculum, they, they, they get all of this. Um, uh, you know, they incorporate all this into how they learn data science. Um, and then what happens is they graduate, they go to a, they go to work for a company, and then they might be put into a situation where you know they're kind of forced into you know to do something that might not really align with that, or you know they, they might not be able to apply what they learn to you know live about how to find contact with a different perspective. I mean, so my question is, you know, what are your thoughts on? How we can best prepare students to handle these types of situations where um, if they go to a company and they might be forced to, you know, have to try to push back, but that's really hard for a company to do, especially if they're kind of entry level or they're just starting out. Um, and what kind of support might there be or should there be uh, for students after they graduate uh, to be able to deal with those types of situations? Great, thank you. So I, I don't know how much the panelists uh, could hear, so I'll repeat a, 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 a short version of that real quick for you all, which is. Um, uh, what are the are your thoughts on how to go about best uh, uh, sort of training, preparing students for specifically working in context and industry 
where they might run up against issues, uh, you know, that maybe they've learned a little bit about how, you know, what, what's, what's wrong or something, but how do we actually train them to maybe effectively and practically address uh, some controversial or difficult situations uh, once they're sort of out in the real world uh, outside of the university? Um, I'll, I'll hit it really briefly. briefly. I mean, I think we have a unit on data capitalism, um, which I think is really useful. We have a unit on industry um, and we encourage, I mean, I, I think the whole point of the HCE toolkit is to allow students to have a vocabulary for that pit in their stomach when they feel like something is unethical or something is wrong and they're not quite sure how to articulate it. Um, and again, being able to be very clear that um, sometimes they'll be the only person in the room that sees a problem because they're the only person in the room, um, you know, with their kind of background and expertise. And that, um, and to show them historically with examples that, um, you know, sometimes risk is required, right? Like, like what they risk in, in saying something or speaking up in the context of a corporation um, might be their job. Like, you know, and, and just being very clear about that. Like, and, you know, sometimes we don't want to do that in our position as instructors uh, is risk our own jobs. But frankly, I mean, we've all watched um, the conversations around ethics and the need for some kind of better language and some kind of better preparation. Um, and it's not merely technical. And uh, the risk of not speaking up in the room uh, for their professional career might be much worse than uh, losing their job. Um, other other hind harms uh, might be involved. Morgan. Sure, just building on on um, what Mauricio said. So one thing I, I I always try to strike this balance with students between individual empowerment and acknowledging that the individual can only go so far, right? We're embedded in institutions. Those institutions often have kind of capitalistic imperatives um, that are sometimes at odds with, with ethics. That said, um, one thing that we really emphasize in, um, in this master's class that I teach are is uh, effective reading synthesis skills. Um, we do a ton of reading and I have them synthesize it every week. Um, effective writing skills. This is something some of them haven't really had a class focused on writing sometimes at all ever since like high school, sometimes not even in undergrad, um, and presentation skills. We have four different presentations we give in the class. We give, we give feedback on that. Um, and then we have discussions every class period, right? We break them off into little groups. We have them talk about it. We rotate between the groups and, and um, kind of help scaffold those conversations. Um, and I think this kind of pra practice is really key on all of those levels. Um, being able to effectively speak up means that you have to have the language and you have to have the comfort with, with getting in front of a group potentially, with pushing back, with using that language, with applying it to particular case studies, to, to um, pushing back sometimes against, against colleagues. And so we, we do a lot of practicing of all of those skills um, in the class. We all, I also very much talk specifically about um, good teamwork skills. Um, and again, this is something that we're, I mean, we're constantly thrown into teams in these technical um, classes, right? Not all classes, some of them do, but not all classes talk about how, how can you be an effective team member? How can you make sure everyone's included? How can you make all the, sure all voices are heard? If someone's being quiet, how can you, how can you gauge that? And then when do you reach out um, to, you know, I frame ourselves as helpful managers, right? Like ideally you have a helpful manager you can reach out to to help you with these kinds of things. Um, in the class, it's, it's the instructors, but, uh, but yeah, we really try to just, you know, foster those skills over and over and over in the class itself. Could I say a little bit also that builds on something Ari said yesterday about Data 104? Yes, there is a final project. Yes, we've always heard from students, we'd love it to be a design project so that we can like put our data science, human context and ethics directly into technical work. And we keep saying back like design projects are wonderful. And in this class, we're teaching you how to express arguments in writing. Because at some point, whether it's entry level or further on, your persuasiveness in a written memo is going to be 
more key to your effectiveness than what you can do with your technical skills. And we acknowledge like there's plenty of value in doing design projects, but our final capstone project in this course is figure out a person or an audience whom you want to inform about an HCE question in the datafied world. And don't tell them what the solution is. Encourage them, give them a way to think about it. So we want to make sure that this notion of addressing yourself to an audience conscious of the power dynamics and also conscious of your HCE skills is part of your work as a data scientist, that it's not all simply designing together. It's also crafting arguments and community around them. I, I'd just like to add, like, I think that there is like the reality that uh, like an early hire at a tech company, I mean, isn't going to have that much power as an individual, even if they are able to convey the point that they're trying to make very well, even if they're trying to sort of like articulate like really effectively, like, why is it important that you have the context of this data? Like, why do archaeologists not consider artifacts that have no context or tags or anything like that with them? Like, why do they consider them kind of functionally not helpful or useless. Um, and the reason is like methodological. It's not It's not just like sort of like pie in the sky stuff. It, it's practical. Like you don't know where to place this stuff if you don't have the context for it. But like, even if you can convey that in an effective way, it's possible that as an individual, you just don't have that much power. And I think that the kind of the short answer to that is like collective power is incredibly important. Uh, and so something that I've been thinking a lot about for the curriculum for the Center for Applied Data Ethics has been how to teach people who are going to be coming out of this program uh, the importance of collective worker power and how to use that to uh, to make sure that they can get their concerns at least heard, if not listened to and, and met. Great, thank you all for your thoughtful and, and excellent uh, answers. Uh, we've got a little time left, so I want to see if there's any any last questions here. Uh, yes, yeah, right there in the red. How do you become friends with whether or not your data is important that it's specifically building up the Wow, really, really powerful question. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna re re repeat that as well. Um, and again, correct me if I, if I miss kind of uh, repeating it. But how do we, you know, teach our students if they come across a data set that has that that that, that, that is. Uh, racist or otherwise harmful to marginalized populations, but appears to have some kind of other usefulness in a different kind of context. How do you weigh those different things and what do you do with it? Is that an accurate representation? Okay, thank you. Um, anybody who like to tackle this? How do you weigh these? these, oh. these? Well, let me start and my colleagues can jump in and amplify as well. Um, there is no innocent data. So all data, like you say, has the potential to do harm. And one of the first things to do is to help students recognize the ways in which data not only can do good, but can do harm. And one of the key ways, especially in the social structure in which we live, is to recognize that because data embeds and embodies the fault lines of our society, that you should look first for the ways in which harm is existing, like done in existing ways in society. And so in data 104, we say, this is the United States. One of the fundamental ways in which data is used to do harm is around race and white supremacy. So always look for that first of all. So it's not something that is like, it will never be in your data. Rather, it is always going to be in your data because this is the United States. And you can come up with a sort of generalization of power dynamics in other countries around the world. But first, have them tune to see like that's always going to be in there. How is it in there? And then since it's not like, you know, a binary zero or one harm or no harm around race, because it's always in there, you say, 
um, how are you going to deal with this specific data set? Like in what ways is it, can it have, does it already evidently do harm or can it have the potential to do harm? Part of it about that is about classification. Part of it is about how the data was collected. And part of it was, in fact, there are, there are data sets that can do harm, but are also deeply responsive to the experiences of the communities that generated it. And that takes a very special kind of thoughtfulness and, and delicacy to work with. Like, assume that it went through an IRB, and we tell our students, like, you have to go to the IRB if you're working on human data, institutional review board. Still, your responsibility as a data scientist is to think in advance as far as you can about all of the ways, all of the ramifications, and then know that there's still something that you haven't probably thought of. So it's this like continuous iterative process of first recognizing it to start and then coming back at each level of analysis and saying, am I doing as good as I can on this? I mean, maybe it would be useful to come up with an example of a data set because I'm thinking very abstractly here, but maybe like Mauricio can bring in something from the data that you do with um, the, the data that you work on for your own um, research. Um, I could, the, the thing that I wanted to bring up and I will put in the um, database is that we want to give students a set of case studies. And the one that we use in the course is actually Joanna Radin's work on um, the uh, Pima Indian diabetes data set. Um, and that I think in, embodies a lot of the concerns of non-innocent data that you were describing, Catherine. Ah, um, so do you want to speak a little bit about that? Uh, I'm sorry, we're playing with yeah. like trying to make the computer work. So we're a little distracted. <laughs> Um, sure. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just say something very, very briefly. I mean, I think um, being able to draw on the case studies and being able to draw on the fact that this um, diabetes data set was used not only uh, for medical research, but for machine learning um, is incredibly important. And so this is one story where you're like, look, this data set was taken. Um, and there are histories of extraction and representation and violence having to do with Native Americans that have a very different relationship to um, the extractiveness of data sets and the extractiveness of resources and the extractiveness of many other things. It's just a history of extraction. And so being sensitive to those histories um, changes people's relationship to um, anything that comes out of that place, whether it is land or agriculture or data. Um, and so being able to have some kind of vocabulary that is historically based um, that listens to the people involved about what they believe their data um, should be used for and why and um, what its expiration date is, um, what, it, what its intended purposes is, um, why it shouldn't be used for other purposes beyond the, 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 the consent that was given. Um, all of these have to do with the history of the relationship between scientists, the US government and uh, sovereign indigenous nations in the US. Um, and so being able to see, like, this is a case study where we have a non-innocent data set. Um, this is what data scientists wrestled with. Um, this is what the community wrestled with, um, is a concrete example of this kind of embedded harm. You could do the same thing with data sets about green lining and red lining. You could do the same thing about other, other kinds of data sets. Social scientists tend to, to be able to engage these things um, with a historical view. Okay. Any other responses, uh, Morgan? Um, if it's okay, I'll, I'll I'll be very brief. I I very explicitly say to my students at the beginning that we take on weighty topics. We will talk about really problematic case studies. Um, we, and that's part of the purpose of the class. We want to explore and understand how data science practices can often perpetuate and reinforcing existing lines of inequality. Um, that said, I. You know, I've, I've been through a number of trainings and, and a lot of my, my own um, background um, through communication and anthropology kind of primed me for um, 
for bringing nuance, broader context, history into those discussions um, and to really contextualize those, those sensitive topics, right? That said, I also say to my students, I might mess up. Um, I'm still in the process of learning. Um, we never stop, none of us ever stop, right? And I really try to make my classroom an open, empowering place that people can call me to account. And I will very willingly own up to, to messing up and to do better, right? Um, so that helps, I think. Um, I think, again, acknowledging that nobody's gonna be perfect at this, um, that we all can do our best. Um, we are all drawing lines in the sand and if we mess up, we just need to fix it and move on. Great, thank you all. Um, it looks like we're already slightly over time. Um, uh, so um, I'm sure that some, there's still some more questions out there some questions in the chat. Uh, if you're interested in resources, I know all of us um, uh, you know, here on the panel have lots of suggestions. We've prepared a lot of things. Some of us have stuff up on websites, other things in, in uh, process that we're happy to share with you uh, to give kind of more examples, uh, more things to work with. So please um, you know, feel free to reach out, come talk to us. Uh, if you have more questions, um, I'll be here for a bit for those of you in person, happy to chat some more. Um, but uh, I want to end just by thanking uh, the panelists for taking uh, their time out of their day to share uh, the really extraordinary expertise uh, and, and experiences um, and come and share it with, with you all today. So, um, uh, and, and I, so I want to tell the panelists really quickly that, that while this panel was going on, all the students from Tuskegee came in and watched the whole panel. So that was kind of a cool addition to, the, to how it worked out. All right, well, I guess that's that's it. Thank you, everybody. And um, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everybody in attendance. And I uh, hope to continue the conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, um, only a few technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just gonna end it. Oh, sorry. Uh, how do I get, I'm probably gonna need to get rid of these guys uh, to see it. I uh, I know, but I can't uh, see the mouse. Where's the mouse? It doesn't respond to your finger either. It responds to the finger, or it did a minute ago.